Or more, I know more things. Okay, here. Yes, I don't know. Uh, I because
Hedeke University in Germany. And today we're going to talk about will the new focus on the quality hold its promise for improving child health outcomes. So without much further ado, please get welcome to Dr. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So nicely introduced, and um, it's really kind. Thank you. So um, you have mentioned already about our application. Um, so that's my team, a small team. Uh, we are working together since um, February 2018. So it's a young group. It's the first professorship for global child health in Germany. So it's a, a, a pioneering field, I would say. Um, and we. Um, so how did we? Uh, uh, Evolved. So they, there was a, an effort by members from the German Society of Tropical Pediatrics and International Child Health. They wrote an application to the Friedrich Springer Stiftung to support such a professorship, and University of Witten Herdecke was um, very happy to accommodate us. And here we are. Um, the topic of my talk, uh, I already, you have already mentioned. Um, so I just want to go straight into. The topic, um, that's a brief outline. I'd like to start um, with my own quality journey. Um, so I give you a personal perspective how I got into contact with ideas around service quality and uh, that these issues are really important. So I want to give you a few snapshots of my journey into quality and then introduce a few more um, concepts to conceptualize these um, these. Uh, uh, these uh, snippets of um, uh, quality issues, and then introduce a few more um, concepts related to uh, service quality, um, mainly quality health systems, um, effective coverage, and some standards of quality care. So um, my quality journey. This is a slide from 2003, and you can still see the very nice uh, Windows 95 uh, um, background, uh, the way how we did it in the time. And, we, I was working in Malawi for eight years um, as a uh, clinical advisor to the Lighthouse, which is a service provider for um, people living with HIV. And um, we were um, setting up uh, to receive some patient feedback a suggestion box. And we regularly opened this suggestion box and then also analyzed the responses um, of people. And um, uh, at that moment in March 2000, uh, in August 2003, the majority of comments um, were and complaints were related to patient flow and waiting time. That was a bit um, uh, not surprising uh, because we also saw that our patients wait a long time and we were aware. But now we really had it black and white. And what did we do to address this? Um, I wanted not to really blame clinicians or blame anyone. I wanted to get some further evidence and we did a very little room audit over two weeks, and I think uh, for, for six days in these three weeks, I asked the guard to knock at the clinician rooms, we had four of them, and just look at certain time points, um, namely 8.30 in the morning, 9, 10, 11, 12, 30, and 3 p.m., and just checked how many, whether a clinician is in there or not. Yeah? Because I was um, thinking that sort of the long waiting time is also due to absentia um, and absentism from the clinic rooms. And um, what came out was that actually at 8.30 um, there was none in the clinic room, but these were only for observations. Um, at 8 at 9 o'clock, I mean, at least one clinician came, was available um, uh, um, at um, two um, days when we measured this, so that's relatively, this is a very small and a bit incomplete study. Um, uh, and then at 10 o'clock, uh, sort of people picked up, uh, and then sort of it dropped out a bit, and um, I finished, uh, we finished at 3 o'clock. So the, the conclusion was here, we really will have to start early in the morning. Patients were waiting from basically um, 7 a.m. in the morning, and um, already waited um, for one and a half hours or two hours before the first patient was seen. That was really, um, I think, quality related, I thought. The second thing which we did was um, later in 2005, um, we did an exit interview. So we asked about 200 patients, we had a structured uh, 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 um, questionnaire uh, across several domains like privacy, like uh, quality of um, uh, like, like quality of services in terms of examination, history taking, 
um, and several others. Um, and uh, that's just a very short summary slide um, of some of the findings. Um, so it's quite striking. 70% of patients were not asked to open their mouth by clinician patients said when they have finished the clinic, um, uh, 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 the clinic visit. So although um, one of the key findings in HIV is oral rush, and we were a bit shocked about this, um, uh, then there is also an awareness of privacy um, and gaps for on privacy. People didn't like uh, the situation at the vital sign area. Um, they were all cramped um, together and had little privacy, and then the body weight was shouted and so on. That was a problem. Um, in terms of uh, pure HIV care, well, um, actually not too bad. They were asked mostly for remaining pills uh, of the ARVs in the bottle, uh, and um, also whether doses were missed and body weight and temperature were also taken. That, that's quite good, actually. So these were two things uh, that during the time I was in Malawi. Then um, I moved to Liverpool, uh, as she said, um, and I was looking regularly at applications as then you are a cross director, as you also do. And um, I took here a quote from an um, from a Nigerian applicant, a medical doctor, who uh, illustrated uh, um, the situation uh, he is working in. Uh, and I just put in bold here a few things which are standing out. And um, what caught my atten attention was really that these issues were not related to direct patient uh, care and patient-doctor interaction, they were really around health systems issues. They were about governance, they were about corruption. These are the things which uh, make services really hard for me. So again, um, uh, it widened my view that uh, it's not really only the service in the clinic which matters to service providers and patients, but also the, the wider picture. Um, when we had, we are, we are um, establishing a hospital club, a university partnership with a, a university hospital in Madagascar at the moment. And um, a couple of months ago, I visited Madagascar. And when I was at the university hospital clinic, uh, this poster caught my eye. And if you look at this carefully, so there is a note, a Madagasi note uh, here, a bank note um, crossed out, no money for clinical services, no money for examinations in the laboratory, no money for um, test blood tests. Obviously, there is a problem in this area with sort of unauthorized payments, yeah? because the services are supposed to be free. So corruption is a big problem. Um, it's, it's about an uh, abuse of, of power for personal benefit or personal gain. And um, health services are actually relatively prone to, um, to corruption, because often there are multiple players uh, involved, there's often poor record keeping and poor accountability, and, uh, and sometimes it's also not easy to distinguish between corruption or honest mistakes or um, sort of inefficiencies. So it's, uh, it's a gray area, and um, um, there is an increasing literature uh, around the impacts of corruption on health services and health outcomes of patients. Um, so the last thing was um, a literature piece, um, a paper on um, the, uh, uh, it was titled Rethinking Assumptions About Delivery of Healthcare. Um, it was published in 2018, I think, in JAMA. So, um, and, it, um, and it really made me rethink. Um, for example, um, this is a summary picture from this study. Um, they were looking at um, several hundred um, private uh, care providers, in, mostly in, um, in India uh, and in Asia and Vietnam, for example, and um, uh, uh, looked at how much time they spend during primary health care with their patients. And one assumption is usually um, if there are enough doctors, if there are health facilities, then that's enough for, for good patient outcomes. But um, it's not that, not always. That, that primary health care providers spend a lot of time with patients. In fact, sometimes they spend just um, half an hour, for example, with patients per day at primary health care. That doesn't mean that elsewhere patients um, are, there are lots of time spent with patients, but there are quite a lot of um, 
primary health care facilities where people spend relatively little hour with patient care in primary health care. The second thing is um, qualification doesn't equal quality. Um, and, um, and this is another uh, sort of a, a summary of several studies from several parts in sub Saharan Africa, which um, compares um, the um, adherence to uh, a standard um, questionnaire which tests the knowledge to manage uh, certain childhood diseases. Um, and um, different colors are always compared in different countries. Medical, this is sort of a World Bank survey. Um, medical officer and nurse. So, for example, the Kenyan nurse, on average, um, sort of um, it knows much better about clinical services than doctors in Madagascar and nurses in Madagascar um, and doctors in Uganda, for example. So, quality, so medical qualification doesn't necessarily translate into uh, into um, knowledge of, of management. And finally. Um, this knowledge, even if they have knowledge, this may not translate into actual practice. So um, here, they use standardized patients, so type of fake patients. First, actually, they gave um, um, medical doctors uh, clinical vignettes uh, and asked them to respond and answer what is the correct treatment and not. So the medical doctors did quite well. So 80% here in China, this was around TB treatment and um, the diagnostics. They, they, most of the part, they, they, they answered correctly. But then when uh, independent observers observed them, what they do in practice, this was really much, much less correct. So even if you know what to do, it doesn't mean that you do the things in practice. So again, I thought, hmm, that's quite interesting. Let's look a bit more into what is already known. And when you start doing this, what you mostly find is, wow, there's so much on it already. So, um, and this is what I want to introduce now, quality health systems. Um, first of all, there is a bit of a change priority. We are now in the SDG area, uh, era, um, uh, but we have um, um, uh, we had the MDG era until 2015. Team, um, which focused with the MDGs, and especially the health-related MDGs, very much on survival in childcare. We looked at mostly under fives, um, mostly at infectious diseases in low income countries, and the focus was on coverage. So coverage means like, um, uh, are the people in need treated or um, seen? Um, there is an SDG area, it's a bit more broad. It's really looking not only at survival, but also whether children thrive in a transformed health system. And it's not, not only looking at this age group, but actually also at the adolescents, at the children um, uh, uh, beyond the fifth um, uh, uh, birthday. And um, we are much more looking at the social determinants and the effects of healthcare, and there's a much more global perspective. And there's a shift from coverage to also quality. That's very broad. There is a lot of um, work has been done, um, also looking at the IMCI um, uh, redesign initiative, where there was a broad review of IMCI successes and failures. So, um, following that, um, there was a, a, a search of, of, the, of uh, publications related to quality, not only to child health. So, I have listed this here. Um, again, um, uh, which is, was shown as the pictures, and some of them are relatively uh, uh, huge. So this one, for example, by the National Academy of Sciences, published 2018, 374 pages, it's like this big, right? Um, and also several WHO documents around um, adolescents, even four volumes, um, and this is only the first volume, starts of proving quality maternal, um, and then um, the child, um, so there is a, a lot um, to read, and there's a lot of background, and most recently, the uh, Lancet Global Health Commission on um, uh, quality healthcare quality in the sustainable development goal area, which um, has been published in 2018. So I'd like to concentrate now um, to conceptualize my, my ideas on these major two frameworks, which are not always, but partly related to child health. So, um, one change uh, 
uh, is that um, the W2006 definition of quality of care is very much sort of focused on um, healthcare service provider to individuals, patient approved desired health outcomes, that's fine. Um, and very clearly, very concrete, must be safe, effective, timely, uh, and equitable, equitable, and people centered. Various, the group paper stresses the importance of quality health systems as a um, prerequisite for quality health care services. So it's not only that the actual service delivery needs to be of high quality, but there must be an, an overarching approach to quality. And they also um, center um, and put into um, focus the trusted by all people, the confidence um, and um, the values of um, uh, that, 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 that um, uh, health services have to be valued by people, and that means not only patients but also healthcare workers. And responding to changing needs. The other issue, which is new compared to this one, is that um, it's actually constantly delivering care. So it's not an one off activity, but there must be means and measures to avoid, to ensure there's a constant delivery of healthcare. And based on this definition, Crook and her colleagues have developed a framework. Um, so, high quality health systems framework has been published and um, I very briefly, I'd like to go with you through this. So, there are four values. Um, the first one is really for people. Um, that health services have to be there for people. That is, has, related, has a relation to um, accountability. Health services are accountable to patients, but also to providers. Providers need to be um, uh, motivated um, and health services have to uh, provide means that um, ensure that the health workers are also motivated to continue to work with high quality. Um, uh, services have to be, um, health services have to be equitable, so there is, the, uh, health services have to be affordable, um, have to be available, resilient, have to work in crisis, have to bounce back in terms of uh, in case of crisis, have to mm, avoid waste um, and make the most efficient use of resources. But then uh, um, you you may know the six building blocks of the WHO health systems framework, right? Which is a bit static. But this is a bit more dynamic and takes into account also the um, the aspects of input, and these are here called the foundations, which have an importance for outcomes. So the population, their health needs, governance structures, who is putting up the, uh, the policies and regulations where and how the services are provided, private sector, public sector, tertiary level, secondary level, the number and type of uh, the workforce. This also includes health financing and also the tools um, uh, for research, for monitoring and evaluation. But these are the foundation. They have to be there. Um, they are the inputs. But then there is an important process of care, competence, um, evidence-based care, um, and also positive user experience. That, that's not mentioned in the WHO um, health systems framework. And the quality impacts um, include not just the improved mortality and mobility, but also patient reported outcomes, like confidence in the system, but also um, going back to school, for example, for children, um, which includes economic benefits in the society. And this is an, like organized in a circle. It's a learning system that um, uh, improved um, uh, outcomes here, improved the foundations, which then enable also quality processes. Input processes and quality impacts or outcomes is also not a new uh, model. It's from Donovedia, I've learned, it's an Armenian doctor who in 1966 already developed a, a health systems um, uh, framework as a widely cited paper. So she took that up and I think um, it's quite comprehensive, but I think for me uh, it makes a lot of sense. We are running through quite quickly, I think. Um, Come in. Yes, please, please. Welcome. We have just a, we have a little break here. <laughs> Welcome. It's becoming now a little bit more practical, not, not right now, but later on it becomes a bit more. But I, I feel so these are some theoretical backgrounds I still feel like I wish to pass on. And we'll have um, we'll have 
some discussion later on. So, um, effective coverage is another, it is such a new concept. Um, so, Kanahashi in 1978 sort of defined coverage whether services are firstly available, accessible, that's self explanatory, um, but then utilized, and then also not only once, but there's a, there should be a community of utilization. Quality, um, however, is um, uh, these two things are really closely linked. You can't have coverage, um, you can't have um, uh, um, good outcomes uh, purely by coverage and not without quality. So quality is um, services are safe, um, evidence-based, without delay, delays, proper use of resources, um, uh, equitable and um, people-centered. So that's the WHO 2006. However, um, now somehow we need to bring these two things together. So far we really have looked only and measured by coverage. And here comes in the new uh, concept of effective coverage. Effective coverage is utilization divided by need. So that means if it's one, if this is um, uh, um, if utilization divided by need, people in need is one, that means people who um, are all covered who need the services. Um, so, uh, but then again, what is the need? Uh, is it perceived need of patients or is it the need, the true need? So it must be actually the true need, um, uh, which uh, is, is, is here the denominator. Um, so that's the crude coverage, basically. And um, this crude coverage has to be adjusted by quality. Um, so that we have a quality adjusted uh, coverage, which is effective coverage. So that's the new equation, that's the new kit in the, around the block, um, which um, we are now talking about. Um, and I came first, uh, this, um, this concept across, um, or if you trace back, um, the cascade of care model, um, which we know from the HIV world, is actually already illustrating this, this concept a little bit, where you have the denominator of all people living with HIV, of those who are actually diagnosed, and of those who are on life-saving antiretroviral treatment, of those who actually achieve viral load suppression. So that's a very nice way of illustrating not just ART coverage um, uh, or crude coverage with antiretroviral treatment, but actually who of those achieves the goal allowing to live longer with undetectable viral load. And this can be translated in other, to other diseases. Again, again, here you have the denominator, the incidence of a disease um, for any priority condition, for example. The proportion of people who are, or the number of people who are screened, those who are linked to care and treatment, completed treatment, control disease, good quality of life. And you see already there are some attritions at each step. So this concept is now, and this is now being published, I think, two days ago by Amuzu in the PMJ Global Health. Um, this now uh, is even extended further, um, and it has to do with also quality data, where you have here the target population, population in need, and then you have ex each step here up to here where there's good coverage, those who receive the health service, and here, uh, at each step, there is attrition. For example, the population in needs, not everyone visits the health service, so they might not be available or acceptable, there might be a lack of awareness. Um, is the health service ready? Um, in, for example, do they have the tests available? Are there trained health workers available? If that's not, then you have further attrition of patients. Um, and that goes up to down the line here, not just by quality adjusted coverage, but without coverage adjusted coverage. And this is what we're interested in. But on, honestly, outcomes at each step here, quality adjusted, user adjusted, outcome adjusted coverage matters. Because um, if you look only at those who receive services, you get more than half of the truth. And we can apply this to IMCI, integrated management of childhood illness. So again, should population in need should child with illness? That could be um, pneumonia, the watery diarrhea. Um, and then you can apply this to say, all right, these are the ones who are seeking care. These are the ones um, who uh, uh, meet a service provider who is ready to provide the services. Um, and these are the ones then um, who uh, receive any advice or treatment. Um, and these are the ones then who receive the correct advice, not the wrong advice, and we have, as we have seen by that previous slide, a lot of um, advice, a lot of management is actually not correct. 
And then, um, do they adhere to the treatment? Yeah, you don't know what's happening in the community. Do they take that treatment? Do they complete that treatment? Are they actually cured? Again, and this is what we are really interested in. Here, we have indicated um, ways how to measure this. It's not easy to, to measure this as part of the routine services, obviously. So sometimes you have to do household surveys, facility surveys, and so on. Right. Another final example of care I'd like to introduce with um, another concept I'd like to introduce, which is related to quality of care, are standards of care. And here it becomes a little bit more practical. Um, but I think we are all still in. Yeah, I see. Yeah, great. <laughs> Sorry? Still fine. Still fine. Yeah. Right. I know it's very, it's a bit dry. I know it's a bit dry, the topic. But maybe some, some, some people have ex expected, uh, you know, lots of pictures from the children from Africa with diseases and so on. That, 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 that usually what people associate with, with global child health. But it's, yeah, so sorry, this is not so bad. There is a picture here. <laughs> Good, okay. Um, so, remember, it's, it's getting more practical now. Standards of care. So, we have to have norms against the benchmark our services, right? And this uh, WHO has developed that 2016. Let's go to Malawi, Mulibwanji. To Mr. Piri is a health surveillance assistant in a little hot post, not too far away from the long, about 30 kilometers. He has his clinic this afternoon, the clinic is empty now, so only one patient remaining. Here, a little mother working in the, in the field with her baby on the back, if you can see it, it's his door, health office, and he sees this on the five child with the mother, maybe it has malaria, and he has his little um, um, uh, uh, register in front of him, just going through the ICI checklist, basically. Very kind doctor, he has medicines here, so um, he has done some malaria tests, which he probably shows me. Lots of positive results in malaria season. Here are his ACTs. And then he also makes reports. So he uh, has shown me, he is uh, mentioning and reporting as in the charts and in columns how many patients he has seen with what conditions. Using his, his register. So, um, this WHO document defines eight standards um, related to which are necessary to adhere to to achieve quality care. And then to specify these standards, which are relatively broad, for each standard there are three or more statements, uh, quality statements, who, which specify more uh, what is expected in terms of quality care. And then the question is also how to measure. So for each statement, there are several input, process, and outcome measures per statement. So, what is required in terms of inputs in order to deliver this particular quality or to satisfy this particular quality statement? Um, and, and that's again also for processes. There's processes, indicators, and outcome indicators. So, standards, right? So, we have, for example, um, adherence to uh, guidelines and evidence based care, good documentation. Proper referral, timely referral, good communication skills with the family and um, with uh, the children, considering and also um, uh, uh, acknowledging and um, the children's rights, providing child friendly support services, educational, um, nurturing care, um, having trained healthcare providers in child health care, and having child friendly infrastructure. Yeah? So these are very broad. Um, uh, uh, broadly these, 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 these standards. And then um, I'm looking only now at one standard, which is um, the standard related to patient documentation. right? And this is the wording of that standard. The health information system ensures the collection, analysis, and use of data to ensure early appropriate action to improve the care of every child. So that's again relatively broad. Um, but then, as I said, each standard has statements. So this standard is now broken down into three statements. So the first statement is related to the medical records. The second statement is about the functional mechanism um, for data collection analysis and so on to improve monitoring performance and quality improvement. And the third one is around feedback. The data should be used also to give feedback to the clients. So these are the three statements behind the quality standard two around documentation health systems, documentation monitoring. Now, let's apply this to Mr. Peary's film, in, in Mr. Peary's health post. So, this is the statement one, 
And yes, the children do have patient health records. They have patient health uh, booklets where he records very nicely the condition, the treatment, the referral, the follow-up, etc. So broadly, we can say not too bad. He's entering the growth. Uh, uh, there's an indication of vaccination. That's fine. Yeah, we can take that one step. Now let's look at functional me mechanism for data collection, monitoring performance, clinical quality improvement. And here is his register, which uh, each uh, raw is one patient. And there's a summary, uh, a raw here at the end, where he summarizes all the findings, the treatments, and the diagnostic tests he uses here. And based on this, on every page, he adds them all up, and then uh, completes report form 1A um, from his village register, gives this report form to the senior HSAs, um, who then com com collects from all the HSAs, health surveillance assistance from the uh, Longer district, gives this to the HMIS officer at the district um, um, health um, management team, who then enters this maybe already in the online form from district health in, um, information system or writes a paper form, and then this is given to the MH Ministry of Health to the Center of um, Medical Evaluation um, Department, where they enter this in the district health and, um, information system online map, where they can actually see all right, how many patients have been seen uh, in our districts uh, in Malawi, how many patients have been had malaria, how many patients have been uh, diagnosed with a rapid test, etc. etc. So there is this reporting mechanism, and it uh, is there as a structure. All right? So, um, tip, uh, the second statement. Now, third quality statement. Now, this is about feedback to the patient, and we have seen there is this, um, there is this uh, uh, charts. There are these charts which he has put at the door for his patient, but he doesn't have something like a suggestion box. So he really tells the patients what they are, what diseases they have, what treatments they get, maybe, or what childhood, how many childhood immunizations are. Um, received, but there's no such thing where patients are giving feedback on his performance, for example. So here we can actually not give a full tick, but this in brackets. So this third statement um, from standard two is not valid. Yet. So we have now gone through this um, uh, example. Now there was a big survey in Malawi on data quality. Level, so um, not directly where Mr. Piri works, that's a health post, but at health center level. And they looked at um, 90 health centers and looked at how does that documentation and reporting system actually work. So they did a standard survey from WHO, and these are the findings, or some of the findings. So, for example, um, no stock outs of any register or reporting forms during the past 12 months. Not even a third had no stock hours. That's a bit shocking, actually. So they do not have registers. Right? So if you don't have registers, you can't report. Um, also, um, consistency checks of collected data routine contacted. Not, not really. Only in 41% of these 90 health centers, these consistency checks, whether they kind of make sense, whether the numbers add up, are done. Um, of course, information displays present at the time of assessment, that's quite good, as we have seen in the example of um, Mr. Peary's health post. And very rarely a computerized system is used for reporting. So that's the bigger picture uh, in, uh, or in a representative, representative sample in Malawi. Now why, do, why are we so obsessed with data? Why? Why, why is it important? Should we not really concentrate on services? This is what the patients get, right? So let's concentrate on services and just forget these data. It's not really an approach. It's not really possible. Um, why? Because um, data are essential good quality data for accountability. And um, you can see that, that actors such as Dr. P, Mr. Peary uh, in his health post, but also the Minister of Health are accountable to the agents. The agents are the patients, right? Um, and if, to be accountable, first of all, standards have to be set, and then tools have to be there uh, to measure whether the services meet the standards. So that's the system of how accountability is produced. Um, and again, this is the system which prevents, to a large extent, 
things like corruption, which enables planning, meaningful planning, correct planning, forecasting, etc., etc. And that's the reason why data are so important. Right. I think, um, in the interest of time, I'm skipping through the last few slides. I wanted to show you very briefly the this is a PDSA slide, which you may know. Um, a brief uh, uh, Yakaranda story is an NGO in Kenya, which um, has established an institutionalized um, quality care services following um, a, um, a, a, another approach. And then maybe five lessons. Coming from the Toyota um, production line from the 1980s. So, um, sword, straight, and shine, standardized. If you look at this, this I think sword is about, about um, having this all, basically all about having your workplace in order. Label things, um, standardize, make sure that, that there are protocols that are available, that things are uh, clean and maintained, um, and that the the, uh, the, the, the workplace is in order, the things are sorted, labeled, um, their uh, needless items are removed, um, and it's coming from, from uh, as and If you go to um, to Malawi, if you go to other parts uh, uh, in, in South Africa and in Asia, you see where a JICA is really operating. You see these things, right? But you also see that from American and so on. So that, that was an example from Madagascar. Summary is written here. Don't need to repeat this. Uh, from the move from M Millennium Development Goals to SDGs, focus on child health, has caused a shift in from focus on coverage. Quality, um, quality health systems are a requisite. Um, optimizing foundations process, process and impacts of services. We have introduced the concept of effective coverage to combine coverage, not just to look at isolation of the utilization, but the one who need it, but also whether they get quality adjusted services. Outcome just services. WHO has identified the standards to allow us to manage is the percentage. It's also usually numerical. I mean, mm -hmm. coverage that they usually uh, you look at those who get the service. Mm -hmm. okay. For those who would meet education. So the concept of coverage can only be applied if you look if you look at coverage on the service level. If you know the need. Very easy and it is where we see coverage data, yes, coverage data. It's not because we calculate coverage for appendicitis. It would be very difficult, and then nobody does that. No, yeah. it's very difficult because we would and even the case depending on whether this is cover covering the need or not. Mm -hmm. It's basically describing this in a way a crude coverage. So, uh, challenging, yeah? and also um, coverage of children.